and welcome to Native Pulse, which is a production of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples. Um, this, this conversation series is meant to bring forth the, the heart and knowledge and action of Indigenous communities to the people. Um, so we'll feature a variety of leaders and traditional peoples speaking on things like environmental justice, uh, sustainable communities, and urgent issues as they relate to the health of our homelands. We hope that you leave these conversations feeling uplifted and inspired into action by the many movements across the indigenous world. Magandang umaga ang pangalan ko ay Chelsea Metaflo Trulio. My name is Chelsea. I work for the Seven Generation Fund as the program coordinator of Thriving Women, which is a program that uplifts indigenous women leadership um, in grassroots initiatives and projects. And so today we'll be speaking with two Thriving Women uh, grantee partners, Nicole Gonzalez and Lena Jacobs, on how native birth workers are navigating the impact of COVID-19 and continuing support for their communities. And so I'm gonna introduce them a little bit briefly and then we'll go right into the conversation. So we have Nicole Gonzalez, who is the executive director and founder of Changing Women Initiative, a Native American women-led health collective. Uh, she received her bachelor's of nursing and master's of nurse midwifery at the University of New Mexico. She is a member of the American College of Nurse Midwives and is certified with the American Midwifery Certification Board. Nicole has over 15 years experience as a nurse and has worked as a nurse midwife doing full scope midwifery for the last nine years. Through the years, she has worked on several community projects around birth equity and has served as the founding board president and vice board president of two birth centers in New Mexico. Our second speaker is Lena Benozad Leo Jacobs, who is a Koyakun Athabascan born in Fairbanks with ancestral ties to Ruby and Cochran's on the central Yukon River, and now lives and works in Anchorage, Alaska on Dene, on Dene Na land where she and her husband are raising their family. She has been supporting mothers through birth and postpartum care for over a decade and helped co-found the Alaska Native Birth Workers Community. She is also the owner and principal consultant of Beno Zadlio uh, Jacobs Consulting LLC, focusing on collective impact approaches to positive social and systemic change, as well as elevating equity, access, wellness, and well-being within the Alaska Native community. So I wanted to thank you both for taking the time to be here with us and to have the, this important conversation. Um, to start, it would be great if you could briefly introduce yourself and your project um, if you want to speak a little bit more about than what was already mentioned. And then let us know who your community is, how your community has been uh, impacted by, by these current times. And so maybe um, Lena can start. Sure, good morning. Lena Jacobs, Uza, Danaka, Hilde, Benazalio, Sydney, Pla Alago, Hudan, Fadansala, Anchorage, Lisdo. Ita'a, David Hoffman, Bauza, Ina'a, D. Olin, Bauza, Sia, Yes, Setsu, Ita'a, Badesnaka, George, Yes, Helen Hoffman, Habauz, Raila, Ina'a, Badesnaka, Lillian, Yes, Fred, Olin, Yes, Lorraine, Yes, John, Honi, Habauz, Raila'a, Sakun, Torn, Bauza, Sadanaka, Yadadligat, Yes, Nila, Itan, Yes. Sakadotsi, yes, Saketla, yes, Anasi, yes, Sadadza, hello. Um, hi, my name is Lena Jacobs. My Danaka name is Benozalio. I'm originally from the place of the bluff, otherwise known as Ruby, Alaska, on the Yukon River, River and Interior, Alaska. Um, I currently live in Anchorage on Danina land with my husband and um, we're the parents of six children and uh, my parents are D. Olin and David Hoffman. My paternal grandparents are the late George and Helen Hoffman from Spokane, Washington and my maternal grandparents are the late Lillian and Fred Olin from Galena, Alaska and um, the late John and Lorraine Honey from Ruby, Alaska. And um, 
As Chelsea mentioned, I am a birth worker. I've been attending births and supporting parents for um, over a decade now. And just in the last three years, I've started organizing with a group of other birth workers. And actually the impetus of that organizing was an event that Nicole came to um, that we helped host birth workers from all around North America in 2017 in Anchorage to come together and share with each other and build community. And um, out of that kind of spawned this network of local birth workers here in Alaska. And um, our vision is that every Alaska Native birthing person feels supported, well cared for, and full of the information that they need to make confident choices around reproductive health, birthing, and parenthood. And so we've been supporting families. Um, thanks to Thriving Women Initiative, we received our first official um, grant funding to host more formal training opportunities. And in fact, this week, um, we were supposed to be hosting Cami J. Goldhammer and Kimberly Moore Salas for the Indigenous Breastfeeding Counselor training, um, which was canceled. But we've been really working to um, raise our own capacity as birth workers and localize our care. Um, Alaska is very big and we have hundreds of tiny isolated villages that are only accessible by plane most of the year. And so a lot of our pregnant families have to leave their communities to receive any sort of health care, including, you know, preconception through postnatal care. And so we're working to try to help um, localize care and do what we can to offer more peer support. I kind of jumped right in. I, I, um, I'll pause there and see if uh, Nicole wants to go or if that responded to your first prompt. No, that's great. Um, if Nicole, you wanted to introduce yourself and we can go, we can jump right back into that. Yeah, um, my name is Nicole Gonzalez. Glashi Nishlink do Tochi Ibashishin, Ashkai Soi Desha Chin, Anastasia Desha Mele. I'm Dene from the Navajo Nation and I grew up in the four corners of New Mexico. I am a mother of three children and I reside in northern New Mexico in the Pueblo territory of San Ildefonso. Um, I am the founder and now the medical director of Changing Woman Initiative, which is our maternal health and um, midwifery home birth services and clinic. Um, the organization I founded um, basically came about with my own work as a midwife in this community around seeing the lack of culturally appropriate care that Native women works um, not accessing or not available to them for various reasons here in New Mexico. Um, and so that work um, really evolved over the last five years. Um, and the focus has definitely expanded beyond just birth. Um, just because when we talk about maternal health and mortality rates and underlying health disparities and how that impacts women's ability to access and make choices for themselves, it really, um, there was three areas that we actually focus on now. And the midwifery care um, and the home birth services um, is really only one aspect of what we do now. Um, the two other areas we are focusing on is like community outreach and training indigenous birth workers, um, as well as health policy work. Um, just because there's, you know, there's a lot of data around the lack of access to care that we've known about for a while now, but also there hasn't been any real effort to address those issues. Um, and what I found in going to conferences and talking to organizations like MANA and ACNM and ACOG, who basically are big advocates for maternal health, is that Native women's voices and experiences were left out of those uh, conversations. There's a lot of policies that impact our Native communities without our input or even our representation in those spaces. And so um, the birth services that we provide um, basically focus on providing culturally appropriate care. So integrating 
traditional medicines and teachings, um, as well as providing support and funding for a doula, access to food so our clients get um, groceries once a week as part of their prenatal care, and then up to six weeks postpartum. Um, <clears throat> they also get access to traditional medicine. So New Mexico is really interesting. They're, um, the Native American population makes up about 10.6 of the population here. And there are 23 federally recognized tribes. Um, my own tribal nation actually covers three different states, parts of New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. And so um, we're actually trying to provide services to those communities in Northern New Mexico. And distance absolutely pays um, a part in the challenge of providing care because um, the Navajo Nation is like three and a half hours away one way, no matter which direction I drive. And um, also understanding that the urban Native population, is their needs are very different than the needs of the people out further like Taos and Jemez Pueblo. And so those are some of the, the things that we're, we're focused on. We recognize like transportation is an issue, you know, ability to pay for care is an issue. Um, and then of course, lack of education and autonomy for choices um, is an issue. So we've really focused our programs around addressing those three areas. But it's hard to, to bring about an innovative healthcare model like ours without any type of workforce. And so we have really aimed our community um, outreach and training our birth workers. So we, we hosted a, a breastfeeding training with Cammie Goldhammer and Kim Sells uh, in the fall of this past year. And we, we trained about, I wanna say 20 people to be peer counselor breastfeeding support people. Um, we hosted a doula training in Window Rock and we actually had 40 participants and we, there was actually over a hundred applicants. Um, and on Navajo, there isn't any doulas in that setting. Um, nobody, the, the, the hospitals there don't use them. And there wasn't any training specific to those communities. And so it was a really empowering experience to be in a Hogan and share traditional knowledge around birth but also to see the motivation and the interest of people from community wanting to do that work. Um, the other thing is we, we trained um, 10 birth assistants in December because we're wanting to increase the number of indigenous midwives serving their communities. And one of the challenges with that is a lot of people don't have access to training. Um, and there's very few, if little to none, um, indigenous centered um, midwifery education training or for that matter midwives in the whole United States and so that's why we've focused our community outreach in those areas um, and then of course the health policy piece you know there's we know there's issues in our communities with lack of access and you know we, there's a lot of talk about diabetes and obesity and those sort of things but you know, who is really advocating for Native women's health on a policy level um, with our legislative state and federal levels. Um, I think a lot of people assume Indian Health Services is doing that for us, but they're really not. And so really coming from a place of community and centering Native women's voices and bringing those stories forward, but also transforming story into policy change, um, I think is something that a lot of people don't really understand how to do that. But I think with some of our partnerships um, in the last year we've developed through the work that we're doing, you know, the, the voices and the stories of Native women are being uplifted and people are starting to see that there are issues in our communities. Um, and it's not just even from a maternal health lens anymore, but like from a community lens. Um, and I really appreciate that shift that's happening. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Nicole. I, I feel that uh, both of you have already started, you know, kind of speaking about um, the challenges that are arising, especially at this time. It seems like, you know, our organization is seeing that all the issues, all the ongoing issues across uh, the indigenous world um, are only amplified by this pandemic. And so when you're talking about things like access to, to resources or um, having gatherings where you can have culturally relevant indigenous trainings um, or other things that you started to bring up, Lena, 
um, I imagine that in birth work, those things are amplified as well. And so, um, and in maternal care, like you're talking about, Nicole. And so, um, you know, if, if you can continue speaking on what you started speaking on, Lena, um, I, I'm really interested in hearing more about that. Uh, and in, and Nicole, if you if you too can talk about how your work and your and your project's work is also impacted by these times. Yeah, so um, I was sharing a little bit about how you know the geographic diversity and the isolation of a lot of our villages really impacts our options for birthing. Um, for almost all of our rural remote villages, there might be a community health aid and a small single or two room clinic. And that health aid is the person who responds to all emergent care needs. Um, and for pregnant families, there's kind of this unofficial or maybe official evacuation policy that by 36 weeks, you have to leave your village. And if you're considered low risk in your pregnancy, you go to a regional hub hospital. Um, so if you were, you know, in a village, in Monic, for example, and you were low risk, then you would be transferred to Bethel. If you were considered high risk, then you would immediately come into Anchorage, um, maybe even before 36 weeks, and you just have to wait either in patient housing in Anchorage or at the uh, maternal home in Bethel. <clears throat> Um, right now, um, our, our tribal health care system and Medicaid don't pay for escort to come. And so if the pregnant person would like to be accompanied during this time of being away from home and waiting to give birth, then that family has to make the um, financial choice to pay for that person to come and attend to the birthing person. Um, sometimes that means leaving other children at home. Sometimes it means, you know, the spouse or partner can't come because of that. Um, sometimes the pregnant person shows up without an escort at all and that they're just waiting in the system for somebody, um, you know, a stranger to help attend their birth and then they can fly home after that. So that's been an issue in our healthcare system for a while where we haven't had the local resources that we had for generations, just as indigenous communities, having the knowledge, having our birthing knowledge, having local birthing options where everybody knew how to attend to a pregnant person and a postpartum parent and a newborn child. Um, right now that, that sort of been taken away with this Western healthcare model and people are, are birthing displaced from their homeland. And oftentimes, you know, maybe alone or without the support system that they need. And so we're continuing to see that now. Um, amidst COVID-19, the options for companions to even be at the birth has changed. You know, policies have been changing, you know, in some cases daily for a while. Companions weren't allowed to be in the birthing space. Um, as of last week, companions could come and attend the birth, but they weren't allowed to leave the hospital or leave you know, like the labor and delivery ward until um, the parent and the baby were discharged. And so there's been a lot more restrictions placed now on who can attend the birth, which, which essentially means like the organizing that our group has been doing to provide community doula services. We haven't been able to attend birth. Um, and so those are some of the things that are coming out. We've also, several of our villages have either restricted or banned air travel in order to protect their communities. And so some of these people who are coming into Anchorage to get their essential health care are feeling concerned about whether they can even go home right now. And if they do go home, a lot of the villages are requiring a minimum of 14 day quarantine. So if you're going home, you're a brand new parent, you've got a brand new newborn, and you're being told to quarantine, can't have anybody over, can't receive any support or assistance to tend to you and the baby, that's a really hard situation. Um, we still have over 3,000 homes in Alaska that don't have running water, and that's the number one thing that people are saying to prevent COVID-19. Wash your hands, right? So how do you do that when you don't have adequate running water in your community? 
Um, what do you do if you get sick and you don't have a nurse in your village? You don't have a PA in your village. You don't have a doctor. Um, you might have a telehealth option, but the bandwidth is so low that you can't access that care either. So um, these things existed in our healthcare system for a very long time. And now that um, we've been hit with this pandemic, it's coming to light even more. And some of the things that we're even telling our own people to do to care for themselves aren't realistic because we don't have the infrastructure to support that. Um, so in general, it's really impacted our healthcare, um, but for pregnant families, you know, there's new dynamics to consider. It, it can be challenging enough just being a first time parent and figuring out this system and being away from home. But now with these new fears and anxieties and ways of adjusting to life postpartum, um, it's just, it's really been complicated. So those are some of the things that I'm seeing here. Um, I'm also seeing that people aren't um, feeling well supported, they're feeling isolated, um, they're feeling like they haven't had access to healthcare. I have a friend who um, is in her second trimester and hasn't actually been seen by a midwife yet throughout her entire pregnancy. And so there's some fear and anxiety surrounding that. Um, and so it's what we're trying to do to respond to that is we've started creating care packages and, um, you know, for example, our families that are from outside of Anchorage who are here waiting in patient, patient housing, the cafeteria has been shut down. So they have um, meals delivered directly to their rooms and sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes they do have a companion there but they're not included in the meal distribution. And so we have people who are actually feeling hunger and they can't go to the stores. They don't have transportation and they don't feel safe. Um, there aren't stores on the, on the healthcare campus. And so we've been putting together food bags, snack packs. Um, we're currently putting together like stress, stress reduction, self-care packages with, um, we've got some really amazing indigenous artists who have been coming out and making coloring pages available free to download. So we've got some really amazing artists whose artwork we're sharing um, with like therapeutic coloring and homemade salves and balms and calming teas. And um, we're currently gathering um, supplies for beading, crocheting, skin sewing, people who wanna keep their hands busy and their minds occupied while they're waiting. Um, engaging in our traditional arts. So we're trying to do what we can as safely as possible to procure supplies to help our families at least feel the love that we've put into these care packages and also to just feel like they have resources even in isolation. Um, we've also been looking at creating virtual spaces. So I um, will be hosting a second virtual Indigenous Motherhood is Sacred online space tomorrow for pregnant families. And that came about through a parent who contacted me directly and said, I'm feeling scared, I'm feeling isolated, I'm feeling like I really need community right now. And if I'm feeling that, I can only imagine that other pregnant moms must be feeling that too. So would you um, help create a space for us to come together and build community and mutual support and also maybe get some um, educational opportunities for things that we can be doing during our pregnancy. And so um, last or two weeks ago, we had our first call. Um, we had an indigenous midwife call in and share about traditional plant medicine. And um, tomorrow we're gonna be talking about hypnobirthing. And so these are topics that the parents themselves have shared with us and um, we're finding people who can help address these topics and just really build community. And the feedback from that first one was so positive and there were just tears of joy on the call for people saying I needed this so much. This is the first time I felt really connected to other pregnant people. This is the first time I've actually stopped in the midst of 12 hour COVID response days at work to just think about myself and focus on myself and my baby and I really needed that. Thank you. So that's really been um, 
kind of a bright light amidst this is thinking about innovative ways that we can build community and think about how we can cross those barriers or boundaries between urban and rural and opportunities with healthcare, opportunities without, without healthcare options and just all come together. Um, and I don't know that we would have been so quick to build this space if we weren't forced into it by this social isolation that we're all in right now. And so it's been, it's been pretty cool to see some of the ways that new opportunities have emerged to support each other as birth workers. Yesterday, I was just on a call, a Zoom call that um, Rhonda Lee Grantham hosted with Patricia Gonzalez and Cami Goldhammer. It was for pregnant parents, but they also invited in birth workers to learn knowledge from other birth workers. So there's all of these things that are popping up for us to learn from each other as birth workers, but also to care for families um, as part of our practice that I've been really, really grateful for. And I don't know that it would have been available um, had we continued moving forward, just having these options in person locally. Um, so that's been a little bit of a silver lining that I've been really happy to receive. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it it sounds like um, it sounds like some of the things that Nicole had listed before or talked about before. Uh, you might have some similar challenges and responses mm -hmm. to those challenges in the Navajo Nation, Nicole. Yeah, I think um, because my focus mm -hmm. is providing direct services and as a clinician, um, there's, some, there's some specific frontline provider challenges that we've had to encounter and overcome and think about. Um, more importantly, like protecting ourselves um, because we do come into people's homes. Um, you know, right now, San Felipe, they have a lot of positive COVID people. Um, and so it's really like, changing how we practice as, as just a, a midwife in general without the indigenous and title, you know, it's, it's having to adjust our clinic schedule. So like, like Lena was talking about her friend who's been pregnant for two months and hasn't seen a midwife yet. And so I think that part is important for people to understand that the, the, the prenatal schedule is not a set schedule. Right, there's lots of different schedules that women can and see a provider if they're healthy. And basically this schedule is created to, for low risk healthy women to prevent their exposure to this COVID-19 virus in a clinic setting or even just leaving their homes. And so definitely done from a place of safety for them and their family. Um, and then also providing um, telemedicine services, we've had to adjust some of our home visits to like providing um, information on how to do telemedicine and making sure that our clients have the ability to access the internet or phone call. We've actually handed out um, ultrasound and, um, I'm not ultrasound, but um, a Doppler and measuring tape and um, a blood pressure cuff so they can monitor things at home. And then of course we call them but also implementing um, an algorithm of like, if that we call and screen before we see our clients to make sure that they're healthy and well, they haven't had a fever or nobody in their family's sick or that they've been exposed to it in the community before we go see them. Because we see multiple families and it would not be safe if we encountered a sick family and went into their home and then not know we were in direct contact with it and then took it to another person's home. And so we actually have to be very responsible for our own health and safety. And it's really interesting because you're really seeing the impact of our families needing to be healthy so we can also stay healthy and take care of other families. And then thinking about like even those in my home, like my children, you know, they can't just travel anywhere um, because if they're in isolation for 14 days, then I have to be in isolation for 14 days. And so we're really seeing that like relationship with each other impact our health right now. And so our, our thinking right now is like with our families is like their wellness is our wellness. And so we want this kind of cocoon of healing and health for all of the families that we're taking care of. Um, 
some of the challenges that we're facing in providing care in Native communities is like you're seeing lots of tribes close their borders to outside people and visitors, right, for their safety of their community. But we have to go into community to provide home birth services. And so how are we able to do that if there's blocks? Um, we've had to print our credentials. Um, the Department of Health actually um, release a statement or uh, a mandate that only essential workers can continue to work. And thankfully, nurse midwives was part of essential worker. But we had to submit our protocols of how we're going to safely provide care to families and like write it out and sign it and send it to them. And so there's definitely these like restrictions and protocols that we're having to follow just to take care of families right now. Um, and then also expanding our services to Navajo Nation, right? Um, because myself and my partner are the only one providing midwifery care and women's health services within our organization, we have to be really strategic about how far we can travel. Um, and also making sure that families understand that um, because you're seeing a huge shift of people afraid of contacting, contracting this virus at the hospital, wanting to have home birth. And so really helping them understand the dynamics of a home birth are very different than a hospital situation in the sense that there are supplies and things that you need to prepare for for a birth at home. But more importantly, um, the accountability is different. You know, when you're in the hospital, the provider and the midwife taking care of you takes full responsibility for decisions in your care. So does the, so does the hospital. But when you're working with a family in their home and their community, there's that accountability is not just my own, but it's the family's. And so they also have to make sure that they're prepared for decisions being made, um, that, it's, they're, that they're fully informed decisions and they're not just coming from a place of fear. Um, and so there's a lot of education that has to go into that part. Um, so shifting out of the clinical piece and like the safety piece and trying to assess and like provide the services that people really need right now, you know, there's a community response. Um, I've been on some calls with um, some of the Pueblos and it's interesting that, um, I think I was talking to Tia about this, like the, the tribes don't have um, a community response protocol to COVID at 19 when it came out. Like they have protocols with natural disasters, um, but nothing for a pandemic. And so that was something that they had to create quickly and then figure out who their partners were to help. And they definitely called on expertise from community. Um, the other piece is IHS is not working well with the tribes. Like they're not releasing positive case um, people who've been tested and saying that they're from that specific community, which only, is, and we know that's been an issue for a long time with IHS and tribes is that um, that data information sharing isn't happening. And, and talking to people on Navajo, like that's also a situation they're dealing with. The, the, the tribe and the IHS are not actively working together to address the issue. Um, and also in conversations about this and how communities are addressing it is moms and babies are left out of that conversation. You're not hearing them talk about them being a vulnerable population that they're worried about. They're also using US Census data to, to kind of look at what age population is high risk so a lot of tribes here, like they have a lot of elderly. And so they're looking at how to protect their elderly. Um, and it's some, some interesting things are happening on Navajo Nation. So like um, I have some friends like at Red Root who are getting donations to different parts of Navajo. And it sounds like even the buses, like the buses that provide, um, that pick up kids for school, those are being used to drop supplies off at homes. And so it's really neat to see like the innovation that's happening to, to address these issues right now. Um, I think the other thing I wanna say about that too is um, there is a big push right now for CPMs and, and home birth midwives and indigenous midwives and healers um, to serve and provide birth services in home communities. And I really appreciate that because I feel like um, this population of birth workers has been left out of a lot of policy changes that have been against them. Um, some of the challenges I've faced providing home birth services on the Navajo Nation, even though it's my tribe and my nation, um, is because IHS is a closed system. 
like I'm not able to order ultrasound or labs from any, for anybody who lives there, um, regardless of being a nurse midwife, and I have those credentials to order those things. But I'm also not able to even write a prescription and have it filled at an IHS facility because it's, it's a closed system. Everything has to come from within. Um, I've definitely gotten requests from midwives outside saying, hey, we want to come help you. Can we go to the Navajo Nation? Why can't we just provide home birth services on the reservation? And you could definitely do that, but you're going to run into these issues communicating with the hospital and getting some of these things done. Um, what I appreciate about CPMs and home birth midwives and some nurse midwives like myself who attend home births is the, the capability to draw blood you know, at the visit and to take it to a lab nearby and get it you know, draw, get it processed. Um, and also highlighting the whole Medicaid issue um, for birth services in New Mexico. So not a lot of home birth midwives take Medicaid insurance like we're supposed to. I mean, you hear people say Medicaid covers home birth, but really it only pays for $1,400 for all the prenatal care, the delivery, and the postpartum. And so when you have this huge population of people wanting to shift to home birth, um, the home birth midwives don't have the resources sometimes or the income to, to take care of that population because some of them, the, re, the reimbursement for insurance is not the greatest. Um, but also like just getting supplies like Pitocin and to, re, to rejuvenate our current supplies, there's like a two or three week wait right now, I believe Pitocin, which is used to stop bleeding if herbs and medicines don't work. Like you have to keep on those um, distribution sites to get it sent to you. So we're seeing a strain on our supplies, which makes it difficult to expand our service and care to all the people who are requesting it because there is a demand now, but like there's a strain on supplies and even just our capacity to reach them, you know? Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I know that Lena was able to kind of, you know, mention uh, a moment of a story of gratitude and encouragement and hope. And I was wondering if you too, Nicole, had uh, an example that you found pretty inspiring or um, was just a really encouraging response to everything that's happening. I think seeing the communities work together to address the gaps, you know, seeing nonprofits and grassroots and community people gather whatever supplies they have and send it over to communities that really need them, you know, medicines and um, information, like whatever you have, you know, even the, even the grandmas are like coming together to, to, to sew masks for each other. And I think that's pretty powerful to see like the community really come together to help each other, regardless of how far close that they are. Um, and I don't think we've seen that very often. I, I think we saw that with Standing Rock, right? That was a big community response to help that community. Um, and so for me, seeing those things come from our communities, it's like, it's powerful. You know, I think sometimes um, we forget how powerful our people are and our ability to respond when it's needed and necessary. And um, I totally believe we, the people, have the power to change things. And seeing that right now is like, see, we do. <laughs> Absolutely. Before I move on, I just wanted to insert here for, for those that are listening on audio um, that we are having a conversation with Native birth workers, Nicole Gonzalez and Lena Jacobs about their work during these times. This pandemic, it's, it's revealing a lot that you both have said is already familiar to the indigenous world in terms of the inadequacies and all the dominant colonial systems that we have. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of conversation or uh, people posing questions on, you know, are, what are we gonna do after the pandemic? Ha have, have, has humanity learned their lesson? Or, you know, how are we gonna respond once this pandemic calms down. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you both, what do you hope will happen after the pandemic? And what do you dream um, for the future of, of Native birth work? I think for me, you know, one of the things that I keep hearing is just this lack of local healthcare options. And this gap has really been illuminated through all of this. 
And that's what we want to do. We want to have options for local health care. We want to have more ownership over our health care and not defer it to this huge, large, federally run system. Um, you know, all of us had some knowledge of these things and for generations our communities survived and thrived because we knew about the plants, we knew about protocols for raising mothers and raising children and um, one of the things that we are really aspiring to do is growing that local maternal child health care knowledge and growing that local peer-to-peer -peer support network. And so my dream would be that we stop having to evacuate our families from their villages to come in and spend a month in Anchorage to have a baby. If that's what they choose to do, then, you know, than to support that, but not to make that the only available option for adequate health care support. Um, I really love the vision of the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives and our friends who are doing really amazing work across Canada is that every Indigenous community has an Indigenous midwife and they're training their own. Um, we don't currently have, as Nicole mentioned down in her area too, we don't currently have systems and educational programs and training programs based in our indigenous, indigenous knowledges and our frameworks and that are really reflective of our cultures and our practices. And so we want to create that. We want to create our own programs to train our own people, to care for our own people, and to make that um, really locally based. And so that would be my dream and long-term vision. Um, in the meantime, you know, we're working and networking within our tribal healthcare system and existing systems in place now to um, help create these training programs and offering the option of doula support for any pregnant person. Um, we're doing advocacy around support for out of hospital birth. A lot of our parents want the option of um, birthing in a birth center or having a home birth that would be supported by our midwives and covered through our IHS system. Um, and that's not an option right now. And so, you know, we're hoping that as people think about what we can learn from these lessons and the fears of not having local health care during this time is that we would, that our response would be to grow that. And for us, to really take ownership in our healthcare and not think that it's something that belongs to somebody else because if that system becomes overloaded and you're turned away in a triage situation at the hospital, then, then what can you do? So that's something that we've been working towards is, is reclaiming our knowledge, revitalizing our birth information and practices to care for each other more. And whether that's within the system or outside of the system, that's where we want our work to go. And we hope that the response and the lessons learned from this will help support that. What I'm seeing right now is like a pause. And, and what I mean by a pause is like, you know, we're evaluating our systems. We're looking at what's working and what's not working. You know, I mean, even with, with Change Home Initiative, like we didn't just jump in and start trying to help, like you have to kind of see where the gaps are. Um, and I feel like when you work in the system, like I did, I worked in the hospital for years, you never get to see from the user side what it feels like to call and make an appointment or not to get to an appointment because you don't have a car um, or to be in someone's home where multiple family members and transportation is an issue and there's not a lot of privacy um, or even like firsthand experiencing trauma and how it impacts the ability to even just communicate needs and it has nothing to do with resources but even just communicating like this is what I need and this is what I don't need um, and so for me like we're in this place of transformation where this pandemic is highlighting all of these gaps in care, which I feel like Native communities and health workers and birth assistant and birth workers have been like constantly talking about this. Like this is, this is the basis of our conversation every time we come together is these are the problems. This is what I'm dealing with. Um, 
And I get frustrated sometimes because as indigenous people, and especially as, as, a, as a native woman, like we're expected to educate and heal everybody. Um, and really that's not our responsibility. And so how much more evidence do we need to prove that there's a problem? Like there's, there's these issues in our community. Um, I was just on a call with ACNM, um, the American Nurse Midwifery Organization, and they wanted a perspective from Black and Indigenous community around this COVID-19 response. Um, and I wasn't comfortable giving all the data and information about our death and dying because it's like, how many times have I done that already? And nothing's changed. Um, and I, I really wanted to give people a perspective of like, what are really, what communities are really dealing with you know, what, how is community responding? You know, this, this virus has really changed so much. I mean, like on the Navajo, we're not able to practice our ceremonies right now because we can't be together. Um, even having to change how we take care of somebody who's died because of risk of exposure, like our burial practices have had to change right now. And so I feel like this pandemic is really root, uprooting a lot of um, bias and also really showing the ugly side of racism and capitalism. And it's, it's not an ugly thing to see, people don't want to see that part. Um, and so I feel like with this transformation comes rebirth. And I see us rebirthing ourselves right now as we collectively come together, like Lena, she's talking about the communities that they're serving and like how they're trying to meet their needs right now, especially in isolation. I mean, that's so powerful to see. And we're relying on each, on each other and what we know. I mean, you see lots of people returning to plant medicine knowledge to heal and support and protect them. But it's also a reminder of like, these are medicines that have taken care of us. Like, I think people sometimes assume um, the medicines that they use are not um, plant medicines. Like, you know, I grew up using cedar and sage and and that's my medicine that I've grown up with, but I never saw it that way until like, oh, like it is a medicine. It has all these wonderful benefits. Um, and so I feel like when our communities emerge from this pandemic, they're gonna have a better sense of where the holes and gaps are in their healthcare system, in their community system, and also how do you take care of their vulnerable population? Um, and I always believe that when we create a healthcare system to meet the needs of the most vulnerable, you actually will meet the needs of everybody out there as well. And so when you come from that place, um, you actually are elevated and you're, you're more prepared to take care of these things than you were before. Um, and so I see us going that direction. Um, and I love like right now, the Pueblo of Pewaukee, you know, they have the Buffalo Thunder, this big, huge Hilton hotel resort that they're not it's not open to the public, but they've transformed it into a place for COVID patients who are positive but can't be in their home, and they're allowing them to stay there until they're well. And so when I see tribes being innovative like that, and, and it's not all about money, and they're really focused on health care and well-being, like that's the shift that I've been pushing for when I have conversations with the governors and the tribal members, and now they're seeing why. Um, but I want to continue to reinforce that mothers and babies and families are really important parts of that shift that our communities need to not just value us, you know, when we've had babies, but like value our bodies and our spirits and that we're life givers, as well as water protectors and uh, caretakers of this earth. And you're seeing a lot of the workforce come forward to address these issues in their women, right? These are all women coming together to like use our skill sets. And it's an invisible labor that's actually being visibilized now, right? The sewing and the beading and the well being and the medicine making and the support groups, like that's women's work. We're doing that. Um, and also I'm seeing like the LGBTQ also support each other and have these resources available for community and educating everyone about what's happening with them as well. So it's, I might say women, but it's really like people, right? There's native indigenous people really um, making a strong effort to, to be visible with their work and what they're doing. Um, 
I think that's very positive. I think shift is happening. It's, it's an active thing. Transformation's always happening. And so I don't feel like things are going to be completely different after this. I just think there's things going to be uprooted and that are going to be exposed and we can't ignore them anymore. Thank you to you both for, for speaking about a rebirth um, and a dreaming afterward. Uh, even if those, those changes are not so immediate, like you're saying, Nicole, um, but you know, regrounding in, in self-determination and revitalization, like Lena was talking about, and stewardship, like you were talking about, um, Nicole, and uh, returning to traditional knowledge and, uh, and the fact that you're seeing this, um, you had mentioned a, a, a wave of people returning to traditional medicines and, and foods. Um, it seems like it's a, it's a glance at what can be, you know. Before we close out, I just wanted to ask if you had any final words or call to action or uh, wanna talk about how those that are watching or listening can support your work. I also want to add that the, the revitalization of farming is huge right now, right? People are going to get back to their food systems of planting and growing things that you can't just buy at the store anymore. Um, and I, I see that a lot of people are their gardens to grow again, and I think that's awesome. Um, as far as like you know, the things I've, I've actually just been in contact with an IHS midwife just now and she's, I'm asking her like, what do the women need? What do they not have on Navajo? And it's diapers and wipes and formula. Like it's the basic necessities that they're not able to get at the grocery store anymore. And so my, my, my ask is if people can send us those things um, because that's kind of what a need is right now. We're actually making some immunity tinctures and respiratory teas and some salves um, and some um, medicinal like um, hand sanitizers with our partner at Red Root that we're gonna distribute to the Pueblos in Northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about trying to get a water truck to the Navajo Nation, but there's lots of interesting politics and barriers actually making that difficult. Um, and so, um, you know, if you want to donate or you want to send us supplies, you know, the diapers and the wipes um, are big ones. So is formula, but also like feminine products, white um, pads and tampons and, you know, those sort of things. People are having, women are having a hard time getting access to that. And so we'd like to donate those to the communities, especially Navajo Nation, um, because we know it's, it's, it, things are not as easy accessible as they used to be. I think for me, my closing word would just be if you are pregnant or planning to get pregnant or recently had a baby and you are feeling some of this isolation or a lack of support or just the need to connect with other people to support you, then please reach out to us. Um, the work that we're doing here in Alaska is really to support you. And so you can email nativebirthworker at gmail.com or you can go to our website nativebirthworkers.org and submit a form just to let us know a little bit about yourself and, and what you're looking for and um, we'll hope to try to connect you with some support through this time. And we will definitely put some links uh, in the video and for those listening um, for these, uh, connected to these projects. So I just wanted to express our gratitude to you both for, for all that you do for your projects, um, for this conversation. And for those of you who were able to tune in and, and spend time with us, thank you for listening. Again, this is Native Pulse, a production of the Seven Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples. If you'd like to learn more, you can come visit us at www7 G-E-N-F-U-N-D dot org to learn more. Um, until next time, thanks for stopping by. Mm -hmm.